Our final reading this morning is the gospel reading. It comes from Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 43. I'm sorry, beginning with verse 33 and going through verse 43. It's a familiar story, but in this good news, listen for God's word to you. When they came to the place that is called the school, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly? For we're getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this story that presents us with a king who appears anything but kingly, help us to see the power of your grace through the story of your son. So we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a routine every night as I'm settling down for bed. I have one of those Amazon Alexa Echo Dot things right on the bedside table. And whenever I lay down in bed, I say, Alexa, play stand-up comedy for 30 minutes. And then I lay down and I listen to little excerpts from stand-up comedy acts and I'm asleep before the 30 minutes is is ever over. But I I love stand-up comedy. And some of you may be familiar that a few years ago, I think occasionally they may still travel together, there was a group of four called the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. Jeff Foxworthy, Larry the Cable Guy, Ron White, uh, who was my favorite of the four. And then another fellow named Bill Ingvill. And Bill Ingvill has a certain thing that he does that when he witnesses someone doing something that he calls stupid or something really dumb, he just say, don't want to waste his time correcting them, so he just said, here's your sign. And the sign is the idea of I'm with stupid. This, this person is stupid or dumb because of what they did. It would be someone like me having a a new computer and thinking I have everything set up just right, and I'm just struggling because I hit the power button, nothing's happening. I look, all the wires are connected. The computer won't turn on, and finally someone comes in and points to the plug and says, you haven't plugged it in the wall. And Bill Ingeville would say, here's your sign. And one of my favorites that he did recently, although I bet this got him in big trouble with his wife, He talked about several years ago when they first got a TiVo or a DVR where you could record programs or even stop live television. And he was showing his wife how it worked and they were in the middle, he was in the middle of watching a football game. And he said, now now watch this, honey. I want to go get a snack. I don't want to miss any of the game. And so he hit pause. He went in the kitchen and, and came back. He said, now watch this. And he hit play. And of course the game resumed. 
And his wife said, that's amazing. How did, how did they know there that they can start playing again? <laughs> Here's your sign. Well, when it comes to signs, normally we look at them for direction or to give us a, a label of definition of what something is. When I'm telling someone new how to find the parsonage where I live, the easiest way for me to tell them is look for the big sign that says Eastern Virginia Agricultural Research Center. That big sign that's right by the driveway where I live. It's the easiest way to point the way. Um, Hunter may be glad he's not here today because I've teased him about the new property that he's purchased on Minokan Road and how at some point I'm going to go down there and just place a ludicrous sign on his property to get people to turn their heads. And I finally decided this week the sign I'm going to make, and Jackson, I may have to have you help me post it. It's going to say, Future Sight of Hunter Yateman's Bikini Wax Spa. <laughs> and I'll have certain prices listed for services. Yeah, we'll put that one up there. And believe it or not, the very first church that I pastored, I had two folks attending that church that were born in the 1800s. That's how long I've been doing this. A couple of ladies born in the late 1890s. And one of them was as rough as a country woman could get. Her name was Gladys Dodgen. And this will only make sense for most of you in this room. Gladys Dodgen was so rough she made Geraldine Scott look like a delicate southern belle, if that helps you at all. And Geraldine, one time, as we were getting ready for revival services at the church, Gladys told me one time, she said, we had a preacher one time back in the 1920s that preached about something we didn't agree with. And she didn't tell me what it was at first. I'm glad she didn't. And we got so upset that they literally tarred and feathered the guest preacher and put a sign on him, and now I'm going to give myself away, that said, desegregationist. <laughs> they didn't approve of that back then. And they tarred and feathered the preacher. I don't know if Gladys was telling me that as a warning or what the purpose was, but the sign brought derision. This is who this guy is. We don't approve of him. And it's interesting that when the Gospels, all four of them, tell us the story of Jesus being crucified, all four have the detail that there was a sign hanging on his cross that described him as Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And John's gospel goes into even greater detail, telling us that it was the procurator Pilate who ordered that this sign be placed there, and not only the sign be there, but that it be in three different languages, in Greek, in Latin, and in Hebrew or Aramaic, so that everyone there would know this is the reason this man, beloved by many, is being crucified. It is Pilate's way of, as you who know the story know, quite literally, washing his hands, saying it's the Jewish religious leaders making me do this, and so this is my way of saying I want nothing to do with this. So here is your king of the Jews, and because of that claim, that's why he's being crucified. And all the Jewish religious leaders, they get really upset about this, and they say, no, 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 don't have the sign say he's king of the Jews, say he claimed to be king of the Jews, because we don't believe that, but that's why he's being crucified, just because he claimed that. And so this ignomious sign, hangs on Jesus' cross, labeling him a king. And it appears tragically and cruelly and intentionally ironic because this suffering on a cross is not at all what the world thinks of when they think of a king. All four Gospels share the detail about the sign, and also all four Gospels, which all of their differences, they all say that Jesus was not crucified alone, but that two criminals, two bandits, two thieves were crucified, one on each side of him. 
Now, Matthew's gospel makes both thieves, both criminals, bad guys. Has Jesus receiving derision from both of them? They're both mocking him. Luke's gospel is the only one that gives us the picture of the one who is often termed the good thief, the good bandit. Because as the religious leaders are mocking Jesus, saying, if you're king of the Jews, then save yourself. The Roman soldiers hear this and they chime in also. Oh, yeah, you saved the others. Why don't you save yourself if you're really this kind of king? And with all of that derision from his own people's religious leadership, from the soldiers who have placed him upon this cross, and then one of the criminals next to him, even as he's facing his own death, looks over and says to Jesus, yeah, what they said. If you're some kind of king, save yourself, and by the way, save us too. And only in Luke's gospel does the other thief speak up in his moment of suffering and say, we deserve to be here. We did wrong. We harmed others. Whatever their crime was, were they thieves? Were they murderers? Sometimes just described as criminals. But he says, we're getting our just desserts. This is justice for us because of what we've done. But not him. Not him. He's done nothing wrong. And he makes this request of Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, that seemingly sarcastic sign king of the jews the one good thief says when you come into your kingdom believing there is a kingdom remember me don't forget me and jesus the only time he says these words are in luke's gospel assuring that good thief surely today you'll be with me in paradise See, Jesus has already exhibited an extremely gracious kind of kingship earlier in the story. Because it's also only in this gospel that Jesus, at the moment of crucifixion, facing all of the ridicule and all of the mocking from the crowd below, that Jesus, instead of looking down upon them, telling them, Oh, the wrath of my Father is going to come upon you, Jesus instead looks to the heavens and says, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the implications of this upon their own lives. And so Jesus, on this vile crowd, wishes for their forgiveness. You see, there is a theological irony that we see in this picture. That the God who is love has such a great love upon the creation and upon every man and woman that he grants us with a freedom that seems to be too much of a freedom, grants us the freedom to reject him and murder him, to commit deicide, the killing of the God. And that's what they, and that's what we, and our own sinfulness, brokenness, and lostness, still do today when the presence of Christ arrives in our lives. Because sometimes it's too challenging. It's too hard to forgive. It's too hard to show mercy. It's too hard to seek after peace. And so rather than judging this vile crowd from 2,000 years ago, The gospel is intended to show us that if we were there, we would be there with them. Challenging us to see ourselves more in the good thief, who in my opinion makes perhaps the best deathbed confession we've ever seen. And oh, what a painful deathbed it is. As he offers no self-justification for himself as he speaks to Jesus, but simply says, remember me, and in a way saying, just mercy, 
Just have mercy on me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus bestows that upon him. You see, God in all of his foreknowledge and grace, knowing that this kind of freedom that we've been given would be something that we would abuse in a selfish manner, allows his own son to be killed by us, the creatures, <laughs> by humanity, on a cross, not realizing that by killing our God, we are in not so roundabout a way committing suicide, killing ourselves collectively. What kind of creature kills its own creator? And yet that's what the crucifix is. And yet God is so forgiving that even in giving us, granting us this freedom where we kill God on a cross, God still remains forgiving. And three days later raises the crucified son and by the power of resurrection lives again in all of our lives. That is the irony, the theological irony of Jesus as king, that the creation rejects him, killing him on a cross, and yet God the Father rejects our rejection and says, nonetheless, grace, unconditional love, will be the final verdict and final word over all of our lives. You know, I love the Apostles' Creed. It was one of my favorite things when I first arrived at this church because it's so unusual, a Baptist church reciting the Apostles' Creed. But I love it because it shows a commitment of being tied to the longer tradition, the 2,000-year story to which we belong. And I know there are certain parts of the Apostles' Creed that we've talked openly, had conversations about, that not just one or two of you, but many of you say, I struggle with that part or I struggle with this part. The, uh, the part about the Holy Catholic Church, because when you hear Catholic, you think Roman Catholic, but Catholic, little c. It just means universal, the church as it is everywhere. The descent down into hell is another one that troubles some, but it's the way I read 1 Peter chapter 3, and it's obviously the way the church fathers read that, and uh, Jesus' descent down into the prison. Uh, to save the spirits that are trapped there, the prison being held. So descent into hell is fine. But I do, I'll confess to you, there's one word I change when I recite the Apostles' Creed. I don't say from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I say from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Because th thence... Good old Middle English word. Thence implies this idea of the kingdom of heaven being a place and that Christ is going to come from that place in order to judge the living and the dead. But I will, if you'll uh, give me a little leeway here this morning, when I think of the kingdom of heaven, when I think of the kingdom of God, I don't think of it as a place. I think of it as a time. That from that time, whence, not thence, whence, from whence, from that time, already established God's kingdom. And from that time, Christ comes to this place, this time, to judge the living and the dead. I have invested my faith fully in the trust that God's kingdom is already fully established. And that our lives are merely an exercise, moving toward trust and obedience, so that when our final day on this earth passes, then that future kingdom that is not yet becomes now for us in that moment. That sort of theme is all throughout Paul's letters, that the kingdom of God is both now and not yet. Something of the future firmly established where our loved ones who have passed already are and they eagerly await our arrival to join them in that time. Which you can think of as a place if you want to. But for me, I think of the king of the fully established eternal kingdom of God coming from that time to us 
to ensure our citizenship in that place. So what is it our, that we're to do today while we await this king from whence? It's actually rather simple. We are called to be witnesses, to bear witness to this gospel story, to see within it something that has been so transformative for our lives that we believe it can be transformative for our community and we believe it can even be transformative for the world. Oh, it is a gospel for today, but it is a gospel already fully realized in a certain future. And so as we wind down our sacred year together today, come back, won't you? And let's start the story again with the season of Advent next week with eager expectations for a kingdom yet to come but also a kingdom that already is, a kingdom that we bear witness to each day. Amen.